Uh, welcome everybody to Biomarkers in Liquid Biopsy in Prostate Cancer, the role of biomarkers for personalized treatment. And I'm going to get some help with your names here. Rosine Fuentes? Did I Rosine do that right? Fuentes. Okay. Yes, Rosine Fuentes. Uh, Dr. Ros Rosine Fuentes, medical science liaison with genomics. To learn more about genomics, go right there. Um, what we do here at the Prostate Forum of Orange County, if you're new here, monthly presentations led by top experts in their field, fields, get to know your treatment professional uh, ahead of time, and information from when to start detection, PSA, and DREs, to mitigating post-surgical effects such as incontinence and ED. We go the whole spectrum. So we go from active surveillance and detection all the way to post-surgical, post-radiation effects. Zoom meetings of our active surveillance, newly diagnosed groups, and advanced metastatic group to provide information, discussion, and hope. Uh, we don't provide medical advice in our groups. We share personal experiences. Both groups are co-led by Dr. Charles Metzger, MD, retired, who is here tonight, and Ira Caggett, retired, who is also here tonight. Website, www.prostateforum.org. Please check out the website. You're going to find a wealth of information there and, and be patient with us. We are developing this website. It gets better every week. Uh, we have an extensive presentation library there. All of our services are free of charge. Uh, and occasionally you'll get Dr. Metzger's newsletters most Saturday evenings by email. Sign up for the email here at prostateforum.org if you're not here signed up already. Uh, basically, the way we run things is our experts will provide, present for about an hour, maybe more, maybe less. We'll take your questions via chat box after our presentations conclude. The reason why we do this is we kind of act as a traffic cop so everybody isn't trying to talk over each other at once. Then I read the, the questions, the presenters answer those questions, and if there's still ambiguity, I'll call on you and we'll we'll get into a little bit more of a discussion. Um, and we may ask you to clarify your questions. Uh, Dr. Puentes joined genomics, neogenomics, as a medical science liaison through gen, gen optics in 2018. Prior to this, she received her PhD in molecular oncology under Professor Garth Powis, PhD, director of the NCI designated cancer center at Stanford Burnham Presby. Research Institute in La Jolla near San Diego. Uh, and Dr. Puentes has held positions at University College London Hospital and University of Texas MD Anderson Cancer Center. Dr. Puentes' publication focuses on novel molecular targets and drug development in solid tumor with a focus on, we're not, we're not lung cancer experts here, so you might wanna help me with this, KRAS driven lung cancer. I think without further ado, We'll introduce Dr. Puentes and she'll take it from here. Well, thank you, Neil, for your kind introduction. And um, from what I hear, we have the hour, is that right? You um, have the hour, we... absolutely. Okay, so I will still leave some time for Q&A, uh, but do wanna give a little deep dive. Thank, dive. thank you very much for the invitation to speak. Um, I'm gonna share my screen because I do have slides. All right, so I will be talking to you um, today about liquid biopsy and as well as biomarker testing in prostate cancer. And um, I will just briefly touch on who is neogenomics, what is bi a biomarker, what is biomarker testing, um, the current and future uses of biomarker testing within prostate cancer um, and the role of liquid biopsy, what a liquid biopsy is, and as well of its position within prostate cancer. And then I did want to touch upon what can you do as a patient? It's important to advocate for yourselves, as I can see you're doing very finely in this forum, and then have open discussion. So um, at Neogenomics, um, you know, we have um, a very specific cancer testing menu. That is all we do. We don't test for anything else. Um, and all our tests are cancer focused. And we've been serving the community for over 18 years. 
Um, neogenomics um, originated in Fort Myers, Florida. That is where the headquarters are and has since expanded across the US. The closest lab to you guys in OC is actually, I'd say um, our sister headquarters in Aliso Viejo, actually in Orange County. So um, we're right on your doorstep and I myself live in San Diego, um, close. And um, that's uh, highlighted right here. This is our Aliso Viejo location, actually established in 2004. And then Carlsbad, California, um, also very close. Um, and then we have um, also international footprint for pharma studies. Um, so we do have a research branch to our uh, testing. And so uh, what, is bio, what is a biomarker? And I think in the interest of time, what we'll do is I'll give the presentation and you can jot down any questions as I present. And then we can always flick back to a slide if you want to take a deep dive. But I think that way we get the presentation out of the way and then we can have open Q&A. Um, and so a, a biomarker is essentially a substance that can be found in the blood, urine, stool, or any sort of body liquid um, insight, giving us insight into a disease biology. Um, additional also would be our, our tumor and our tissues. Um, Non-cancer examples, are things like cholesterol for heart disease, um, liver enzymes for hepatitis, our glucose levels and our sugar levels um, informing us of diabetes. And these, as you know, we track pretty regularly through our CDCs and are indicative of um, the presence of uh, disease at a certain level, right? Or is the patient trending towards um, something sort of a marker for disease, essentially. And in cancer, these are also seen as sort of unique barcodes that can sometimes be genetic markers. Not all biomarkers in cancers are, are genetic, um, but often underlie um, a genetic variation within a cancer cell, um, identifiable in the DNA as a gene, genetic mutations, in the RNA, um, these are actually fusions or in the protein. Um, and some of these are oncogenes and you might hear this term. Um, and this is a driver mutation, really strong enough to drive the cancer forward. Um, a mutation that causes the cell to rapidly divide essentially, or to forego our natural sort of checkpoints that we would have to keep cell growth under control. Um, and there are different types of mutations um, that are present in biomarkers and that we can use as biomarkers um, when trying to um, use these for cancer. An activating mutation um, causes uncontrolled cell growth, uncontrolled cancer growth, um, increasing proliferation, right? And so this is our gas pedal that is activated. The body sends abnormal directions for growth. We have uncontrolled growth. Our gas pedal is constantly on and it is activating cell growth. And um, examples of these that we use in prostate is AKT1 and PIK3CA. And some of these biomarkers inform us for, of different things. Some of these have targeted therapies. Um, and I'll get into that later. Um, other activating mutations, you might have heard EGFR, BRAF, V600E, um, EGFR, extremely common in lung, BRAF, um, extremely common in melanoma, but also across other solid tumors. For prostate, we've got AKT1, PIK3CA. Those are common activating mutations driving the cancer forward. A deletion is when there's something missing in the gene. So this is all on the DNA level. Um, and when our cells um, replicate, the DNA is translated and transcribed and there are errors that can happen in the process. And so when an error of an area being deleted that is dropped or non-existent, that might be coding for something um, that um, then is deleted, from the um, 
its activity. So um, in this case, what's often um, it implied is that we have a missing part of the gene and we often have what are called tumor suppressors. So this is essentially um, not the gas pedal, but the brake and the brake is not working anymore. And so the control to slow growth, to control the activating pathways, the off switch of our activating pathways isn't there anymore, has a deletion, has a, a mutation um, signaling that the brake is off. And so we therefore have um, uncontrolled cell growth due to that prostate examples would be P10. TP53, another very common example that you'll see. A fusion gene is when genes um, that normally should not be combined combine and um, are constitutively active. Genes are often, um, they join and then um, are detached from each other again. It's a very dynamic process within the cells, but when two things are stuck together um, and indicating you know, cell growth, then and that if that is constitutively active, there's sort of an on signal, um, then it's similar to an event that we've just previously discussed, an activating mutation almost, but it is due to fusions. And um, these are rearrangements, um, and they're probably present in about 50 to 60% of prostate cancers actually caused by fusion. So it's a common event in um, prostate cancers, ERG, ETV1, ETV4, ETV5. Interestingly, fusions can be detected at a DNA level, but a fusion actually um, happens at the protein level. So just a little cancer bi or cell biology recap. The DNA is translated um, into an RNA and the RNA is transcribed into a protein. And so um, RNA, is really where we can look for fusions. And so often testing just our DNA or looking at just our DNA doesn't always inform us of what's happening with our fusions, for example, which are very prevalent in prostate cancer. And the diversity of fusions, I just wanted to highlight this here. Um, we have ALK, ROS, RET, and track one, two, and three, FGFR, BRAF, and CRAF, and um, these different colored dots are sort of where they are prevalent in these different disease states and these different um, types of cancer. And you can see here the black dot in the last two, FGFR, BRAF, CRAF, these are common um, prostate fusions. But this image also highlights that these are also present in other cancer types, other solid tumor types. And all of these have approved targeted therapies um, by the FDA. And most of them are most recently approved. Many of these fusions have had clinical trials to get to these approvals. And so um, it's really um, important to have these highlighted when we're when we're talking about biomarkers. Um, in addition to um, therapies, it can also just inform us what type of cancer it is, you know, how aggressive it is. And so this is what the biomarker can be, a mutation that is activating, it is a, or a stop mutation um, or a fusion. And so why do we even test for these biomarkers? We're running sort of a genomic profile and molecular test, often known as comprehensive tests, where we really, um, this, this is the buzzword for having done due diligence in your testing, if it is comprehensive, it, it is covering everything that um, is relevant for prostate cancer, for example. Um, and so the, the, these biomarkers identify sort of our tumor biology, what's going on, what's driving the cancer cell growth. You know, it, it gives um, the pathologist, the physician, your treating team an idea of what's, what's happening. Um, it helps outline the diagnosis, prognosis, assisting in therapies. Um, 
identifies gene alterations, such as mutations, fusions, deletions. There's some others as well, amplifications, overexpressions, and, and certain proteins. It does help us also identify if a cancer has uh, been acquired by, um, a, 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 or is being driven by a gene that has been acquired or that has been inherent to that patient. So there are some genes that indicate um, you know, a, a genetic predisposition to inherit a certain type of cancer. Um, that is one thing. And then we have the same genes and other genes that can be present without a hereditary basis. And that can be distinguished when, um, we, when we run a, a, a test. And we distinguish that by the frequency, the prevalence of the gene within the, the cancer is one way. So if it's present in about 50% or 100% of the cells, it's very indicative that this is an inherited gene. The other way of testing for this is that we test normal cells alongside um, or in addition to, and, um, and, and, and that gene will be carried in your normal genome, but it will be only sort of activated in the active cancer site in the tumor. Um, and this, why is this important? I mean, it doesn't really affect the patient necessarily in the treatment when there is active cancer, but it does help inform your relatives, right? Um, and it may inform your, um, your risk if you detect a hereditary um, biomarker before um, cancer has actually occurred. Then it does identify mutations to help assign a therapy and optimize and personalize the treatment. And over the last few years, we've seen an increase in what we call precision medicine. And these are therapies um, that are targeted towards biomarkers and that use biomarkers um, for their indication. Um, one cannot blindly give these therapies. They must be matched with the presence of a biomarker. And so you can see a dramatic approval, uh, uh, approval rate um, increasing over the last um, 20 years from 17 targeted therapies all the way to 150 targeted therapies. Um, Lung is really big, prostate not so much, which is really an interesting discussion for today actually. But there are some cancer types where targeted therapies is really booming, where even for one mutation, let's say EGFR, there's not only one drug, but there are multiple. There are multiple generations. If one becomes resistant to it, there's the next one and the next one. And so, um, it's definitely important and very up and coming um, to be screened for these. And I just wanted to touch on the use of biomarker testing within prostate cancer specifically. And um, so the, the biomarkers are used for three main purposes. They are diagnostic, prognostic, and therapeutic. Some span all three boxes and some inform only one or the other of these. So diagnostic um, use of biomarkers would be those that are used for screening. Um, in prostate cancer, we have PSA, right? This is one of the biomarkers we use at the screening time point. Um, they can be used to determine the cancer diagnosis from the get-go. Um, sometimes also stage the cancer and classify the cancer, which can entirely change a course of um, treatment, right? Um, the prognostic element of biomarkers is to estimate prognosis. It helps to stratify risk. PSA is a really important one here in, in prostate. And, you know, um, there PSA is great, but there's also better. And you must you might be aware also of other tests that are used for this risk stratification and how we've optimized the these are all biomarkers um, 
at this time point and for the risk stratification within prostate cancer. Um, and then also we can um, use the prognostic biomarkers um, to monitor and, pro and inform any resistance that is happening. And as well as a very hot topic, something called minimal residual disease. Once we have removed the cancer, cancer often recurs. Um, you know, and it recurs in a scan, but there's this lag time between having what we see on a visual scan removed it and the reoccurrence when values are creeping up, when biomarkers are starting to increase. Um, and there's that this area is a, a large area for research at the moment and it is actually making, making its way into the clinic as well. Um, and so also therapeutic indications for biomarkers um, to inform therapy choice and clinical trial eligibility. And I wanted to outline the therapy choices within prostate cancer. So for these are prostate cancer therapies that I have here in, ar in arrows and sort of choices that are informed, often in fact, by biomarkers. Do we just observe and actively survey um, surgery? the choice to proceed with radiation or cryotherapy. And then um, the, uh, the, the drug that are given, are they, is it a hormone therapy that is indicated? And then three baskets, uh, chemotherapy, immunotherapy and targeted therapy. And I wanted to outline these last four. So hormone therapy um, targeting um, you know, the androgen pathways. This would be um, for prostate. Hormone therapy also given often in breath. Um, chemotherapy targets all fast, rapidly dividing cells. The chemotherapy does not distinguish uh, between a fast growing cancer cell or other fast growing cells. Other fast growing cells in the body are your hair um, follicles, your bone marrow your um, gut lining and your digestive tract, so your, your, your mouth. And this is where we see the side effects. And the uh, side effects are balanced um, with what's tolerable on a dose. Um, and so these are all well, two well-known side effects from chemotherapy. And so we have uh, two sort of tar more targeted therapies. Immunotherapy leverages the immune system does not have the side effects that chemotherapy does. Um, and then targeted therapy also does not have the chemotherapy side effects. And the targeted therapies are therapies that um, are, are matched with a certain biomarker that either activate or block um, the, the mutations or the proteins that are mutated. Um, an example would be if you have an activating mutation um, that is an oncogene that is driving the cancer, then um, you can give a targeted therapy that if, if this is an oncogene, i.e. a gas pedal that is being you know, pushed, that stops that gas pedal, that lifts the foot off the gas pedal or blocks the signaling. And that is targeted therapy, extremely tailored towards the patient. And so what are different um, mutation and biomarker types that we can target with therapy? You have, like I said before, the germline versus the somatic. This is very medical technical terms to saying inherited and just cancer specific genes. But this is the, the language you will hear medically, germline versus somatic. You have cell signaling pathways, which is the crosstalk and interplay between um, signaling that happens in the cells, the activating, and the deleting and fusions uh, mutations that we talked about before. Then you have immune markers that can be blocked specifically. And then DNA damage and damage um, or miss, um, you know, or lack of crosstalk within the DNA replication um, 
uh, time point within a cell division. And this is where a lot of prostate targeted therapies, um, or one in specifically the PARP inhibitors. Um, so for, for some other cancer types, there are many drugs across all these categories. Um, for prostate, not as much actually. And we have the, however, we have PARP inhibitors for DNA damage very good in prostate if the biomarker is present. And so the guidelines, we have um, biomarkers being included into guidelines, right? Treatment guidelines, testing guidelines for patient. NCCN is um, a national cancer guideline that is widely used. And sort of, if it's in here, it's because it should be gold standard in practice. Um, and basically, I want to just skip down to this point um, down here, testing tumor um, for alterations in the DNA repair genes. That's what I was just talking about. DNA damage, DNA repair, such as BRCA1, BRCA2, ATM, PALB2, FANCA, RAD51D, CHECK2, CDK12. I recommend it in patients with metastatic prostate cancer. Why? Because these are the genes involved in the pathway that are responsible for DNA repair that have a mutation in them that the DNA is not repairing. And we have seen that if mutations are harbored in these genes in prostate cancer, that a PARP inhibitor is indicated, that a targeted therapy is indicated. And so these have been included in the guidelines that a um, metastatic prostate cancer patient could and should be screened for these biomarkers. These can also be um, considered in patients with regional prostate cancer and TMB, which is, stands for tumor mutation of burden, sort of a, a count of, you know, how heavily mutated is this cancer? How many mutations are there in, in key genes? And there's an average that's taken and it's a score. Is it high or is it low? This is also sort of a novel biomarker being used and it informs immunotherapy actually. Um, people with a high TMB respond better to immunotherapy than a low TMB. Um, those with more mutations respond better than with less mutations. And um, so when do, we, when do we test for these biomarkers, right? At, at diagnosis, we have tissue um, biopsies um, that can be used. Um, however, liquid biopsy, which is using blood, is permissible. And I'll go into that in a, in, in a minute, um, especially at a later stage cancer, metastatic, progressed, late stage three, we can also use the liquid biopsy. I just wanted to quickly highlight where um, we can obtain some of this um, biomarker information in a prostate cancer patient. Um, some biomarkers are uh, present in the urine. Um, then we have the plasma or blood draws and then um, the tissue biopsy. And here we can see some that are um, um, tested for by staining the tissue or also running sort of genetic testing um, that can inform, um, you know, if we stratify um, cancers, are the indolent, curable, aggressive? Um, information can also be used for tumor boards, um, the targeted therapy, and really optimizing precision medication and medicine for the patient um, and establishing personalized treatment. So these can all be used. Um, for various biomarkers. And, um, you know, the outcomes of using biomarkers in prostate cancer, um, you know, can really, uh, the, the molecular diagnosis helps an outcome, especially in later stage. Um, biomarkers such as PSA and others at screening um, helps to avoid surgery, avoid overtreatment, um, just going to take you through this graph here. We have gradual differentiation within um, prostate cancer, right? We have indolent disease and aggressive disease. And one of the large issues in prostate cancer, um, you're probably aware of, is ironically over diagnosis, over treatment. 
right? And so if we can optimize the biomarkers, if we can optimize the screening, we can avoid over-treatment, you know, um, and, and put this patient on active surveillance and they, they don't have to succumb to surgery or um, unnecessary treatment. The other option is um, to provide treatment pre-surgery to shrink the tumor to then have um, surgery or is it surgery first and then um, a targeted therapy or a chemotherapy and it all can be personalized to the patient. Ideally, this is really the comprehensive um, treatment plan when one does include biomarkers um, in, you know, for the, for the diagnosis prognosis and therapy. The therapy decision-making um, can really optimize and personalize treatment specifically later on in a more aggressive um, uh, prostate cancer, um, chemotherapy, immunotherapy, and then targeted therapy, as well as informing the prognosis. Um, we can, many studies um, show um, various biomarkers being used to assess overall survival, progression-free survival, um, very sort of clinical graphs and data are there to um, optimize um, the field of prostate cancer. What is a liquid biopsy? Um, this is using blood to um, detect biomarkers. Um, so basically our tumors shed what's called tumor DNA, sort of the debris from the cancer that is shed um, in our blood. And we have what's called um, circulating tumor cells, circulating tumor DNAs. And we have the um, sensitive enough testing to distinguish these between other um, DNA that's floating around essentially. And um, from this um, circulating tumor DNA, we can um, have a very non-invasive approach of analyzing that DNA and to, to tease out some of the characteristics of either a primary tumor and also metastasis. Because what's nice is the blood gives us an overall picture of what's happening. Um, it's not just localized to the specific tissue biopsy, but it actually gives a really nice zoomed out snapshot of what's happening. Because sometimes we have heterogeneity within a cancer. We have heterogeneity and differences in, in the metastatic sites when it has spread. And using the liquid biopsy can give us real-time repeated monitoring um, that is much easier than you know, repeat biopsies. And it's easy and pretty fast to use um, you know, a blood sample. Um, liquid biopsies can inform as, uh, different things, mutations such as biomarkers. Um, it can also inform, um, you know, the progression of a patient. Um, the patient can be monitored um, using uh, liquid biopsy as we track res resistance, for example, um, and we can see resistant genes that may maybe up and coming, um, we can see genes maybe de you know, decreasing or the amount of um, circulating tumor DNA decreasing or increasing. And the amount of cir circulating tumor DNA that can be picked up at very low levels. I was mentioning um, minimal residual disease. This is when levels are undetectable in a scan. And for that, you need other um, liquid biopsy tests that are actually very, very sensitive. Um, and here we distinguish at neogenomics between the two and extremely sensitive tests. We have one coming up at the end of the year called radar. There are others out there also. Um, and then our neogenomics, we have what's called the Neolab solid tumor liquid biopsy. This is for tracking the biomarkers that are um, relevant um, in the various solid tumors. And so just to recap, it's non-invasive. We can be used sort of at an initial monitoring um, and progression stage. It can be used for monitoring response to treatment um, and then identifying any emerging genes that could be causing resistance specifically to targeted therapies. And um, the role of liquid biopsy in prostate cancer is 
not as optimized as it is in other disease states, interestingly enough. And neogenomics, for example, we have a panel um, of genes. However, these are not the ones that I just reviewed um, for DNA damage and repair indicated by the guidelines. These are ones that um, you know, may be present and relevant for later stage um, disease. Um, there might be trials, um, but it's not as prevalent and it's not as strong a tool as it can be for lung. And we are optimizing this in the field of prostate cancer. Good topic of discussion here. Um, a big um, hurdle for liquid biopsy in prostate cancer is that 90% of patients have metastasis to the bone and it's extremely difficult to biopsy the bone and access. Um, so that's one place that liquid biopsy is actually quite good um, of capturing mutations and determining the metastasis there. Um, we capture the heterogeneity and sort of the differences that could be occurring. Would there be any um, genetic alterations in the genes that we have on liquid biopsy panels? Um, and it can be very beneficial in advanced metastatic disease um, where we have higher volumes of DNA being shed and we have different um, sort of um, materials released and different genes coming into play. Um, interestingly, we have um, liver metastasis, bone and brain um, as very common metastatic sites for prostate cancer. And these are you know, all very tricky to biopsy. So a, a liquid biopsy is, is an extremely um, promising tool when it's optimized. Um, and it does enable repeat biopsies. Um, a limiting factor here is, or a factor to note that it does not replace histological diagnosis for prostate cancer. You still need to use a tumor um, tissue and it excludes DNA damaged genes um, that would indicate PARP inhibitors. Um, that is just sort of a, a technological um, thing about the assay, why these genes are not included. So an, an overall um, takeaway for how one could use a liquid biopsy in prostate, you know, for broad molecular profiling, um, it can often be a home drawn, uh, home uh, draw, so a, a blood test taken at home. At Neogenomics, we actually offer a um, no cost mobile phlebotomy, we call it. <coughs> Excuse me. And then um, there are, of course, clinical evaluation programs. <coughs> Sorry, I've got something in my throat. Medicare covered as well, five day turnaround time, extremely fast results. <coughs> Sorry. Um, yeah, I just wanted to highlight that. These are the genes in our liquid biopsy at Neogenomics. We do indicate prostate as an indication, extremely accurate and sensitive test. I wanted to highlight what you can hey, do. Jean, do you want, you want me to take this yeah. so you can have a moment? <laughs> Sorry, let me put, I'll have one good cough, put myself on mute. I've got it, Rachel, because I just want to read the headers for these. Perfect. So there's time for Q&A. But what you can do to advocate for testing, unfortunately, patients have to be their best advocate, even in, um, in the best oncologist hands. It's still great to be aware. And so we have, um, here we go. Yeah knowledge for before, during, and after treatment, you could be inquiring about the role of biomarkers. When you are newly diagnosed, being monitored or at progression, ask how does biomarker testing fit into your situation? And when um, 
asking and inquiring about treatment options. There are, be aware that there are new therapies, maintenance therapies that are informed by biomarkers. And then often biomarkers are inclusion and exclusion criteria for clinical trials. So with that, I want to open up to the floor for questions. And um, we are here for you for any um, further questions that um, span beyond the 10 minutes that we have left. We have Rachel Malmberg on the phone, um, who leads our patient advocacy. And um, yeah, thank you very much for the opportunity to speak to you. I hope it was informative and somewhat understandable and excuse the, the cough at the end of it. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Puentes. Yeah, I just had a moment like that with Dr. Metzger. When I just start coughing like that, something's in the air. Yeah. Um, yeah Dr. Metzger has a question about AR-D7 issues. I'm gonna let the doctor ask it himself. Well, thank you very much. Uh, that was a absolutely wonderful talk, very comprehensive, exactly what we were hoping for. Uh, we're in the process of uh, most of our fellows are in active surveillance uh, with a lot of cancer anxiety and questions, and a lot of this fits into that, um, especially the intensification. Um, my my mantra on, on this whole thing is to do it earlier so you know, an intensification of treatment, intensification of diagnosis uh, gives you better handle uh, what to expect in the future. So thank you very much for an absolutely great. Do you think that liquid biopsy finding stuff in the blood, is that the source of metastatic disease? Um, the, the source, you mean the source of the spread in the first place? If you have cancer cell, a uh, cancer RNA, DNA running around your blood, aren't you more likely to have that stick somewhere else? And then that's called metastatic disease. So there's sort of two parts to that. In, in, on one hand, that is the truth that ultimately how the cancer spreads is through the blood, also through the lymph system, uh, but it is slower. So um, the cancer sort of builds its army and progresses relatively slowly compared to how um, our cells are flushed through our blood bloodstream. And so as the cancer grows, it progresses locally within the same tissue. It then recruits sort of neighboring tissues to its army, which distinguishes cancer from a benign tumor that stays in a tissue and just expands and makes space, takes up space there. But cancer also sort of recruits the surrounding tissues. Um, it then builds what's called a cancer niche. So it can spread to one lymph node locally, and then again, stays around a little bit, expands then to the next lymph nodes. It progresses slowly, ultimately pinging off and then sticking to the nearest organ next to that cancer. So in prostate, how the bloodstream flows it is after the prostate, you know, we're, we're, we're going up to the brains, the bones, the liver. That's why we see these as metastatic sites. Um, in lung cancer, the met you have metastasis to the liver next, very common, commonly. Um, so yes, cancer does spread through the bloodstream and that is what causes metastasis. But to get there, it's, you need to pass through these stages. If the cancer is still localized, let's say stage two, and actually also stage one, it is still shedding um, DNA. It is still living and dying cells, um, you know, that, that, that are being, um, you know, taken through our bloodstream um, that are not, in that moment causing metastasis. If you have a stage one, this is not the metastatic progression yet, but you can still um, detect cancer DNA at a localized level. Example, if in prostate cancer, you are at stage one to being surveyed, um, you 
do still have cancer DNA being shed in your blood, but you do not have metastasis yet. Does that make sense? Yes, but if you look at the 40% recurrence after surgery or radiation, which is probably a low number, um, do those would those people have been been um, diagnosed earlier if they had the circulating uh, DNA? Uh, yes. Or... So, so this is where um, it is really if we have recurrence at the same site, you have that because there are still the stragglers that are around post surgery. Even if we we got it all as surgery, you may just have one or two cells that can um, stick around and, uh, and off they go and grow again. And between that time span and seeing it on a scan, um, often, you know, it could be metast metastatic, right? There is that window in time where a very sensitive test could detect the presence of the, the cancer DNA present again um, to higher levels or there should not be none after surgery, right? And we can see that those that re-occur um, do have an increase and those that don't do not have an increase. Um, but that is still at research level, not commercialized yet for prostate. Um, so this is sort of a very up and coming field. Well, you know, the European studies, about a third of the surgical guys don't have surgery because their PSMA is positive. And they never knew that in the past. Bone scans didn't show it. So yeah. is, this, is this a tool that could even make that even better? A hundred percent. I think, you know, these are all tools that could ultimately optimize um, the treatment. And to and me, the, that's where this is really exciting. Yeah, very exciting. If this is it. And, and also for prostate, exciting because there's not many, as many biomarkers as there are in other disease states. So for prostate, um, it's also very exciting. Um, but but the, the the science of it is it's a very sensitive test. And so it's been optimized. Um, optimized also for more later stage. The science has to get sort of specific to capture the early stages. But ultimately, this very promising field, um, you know, in early detection and reoccurrence, um, all biomarker informed and ctDNA, sort of this circulating tumor DNA is classified as a biomarker. Absolutely. This yeah. is an exciting time. Exciting times, yes. <laughs> Thank you very much. This is wonderful. You're welcome. We'll open it up. Terrell has a question. I have a I have a question for Dr. I have a prostate cancer. I diagnosed in February, <clears throat> and some reason because I uh, heart reason I have to take a uh, block in her, so they postponed the radiation. But I already have the uh, uh, hormone therapy with the Zoldex plus the medication, and originally I have uh, um, Gleason score eight and nine, but two different institutions. One of them is uh, uh, John Hopkins and City of Hope. They scaled it back to seven. So my radiation is coming on next month. I should get this test right now or just wait when is the radiation, everything is done and wait maybe a little while and get the test that time. Uh, you mean the, the CTDNA test that I was just talking about? Yes, the liquid. Um, yes. Yeah, unfortunately it's not available yet. This is the okay. it's not available yet. So I would say you are on the right path um, with mm -hmm. your current. Um, and when is going to be there about that? So um, for prostate cancer, um, I am not sure for prostate cancer when it's going to be available. Um, um, I know in colorectal where cancer sheds a little bit more, it might be the first, mm -hmm. it might be sort of the, the um, leader of the field, uh, but we don't have it currently for prostate cancer. Um, but, you know, ultimately we write at Neogenomics are a testing lab, so we can really only advise on, on, on the testing. And so the, um, it, it, the, the therapy and your surgery plan um, would, is entirely in the hands of your physician. And it sounds like you're at two very, very good institutes. So I, okay, I, I, it sounds like you're is, in a good plan. Yeah, my, my question is, you said that this is a liquid um, a biopsy. 
So basically, if, if let's say if I'm done with the treatment, I done with the radiation, but I'm still on the hormone therapy. And when I'm done with the hormone therapy 18 months later, which they said that that time I'm cancer free because they said I can be cured, not just. So after that, should I do maybe like a one or two months later, do a liquid biopsy and you guys can find out if I still have something left over or? So if by then a test is approved for prostate cancer, this would be the space where the CTDNA, the very sensitive test is indicated exactly in that case mm -hmm. or in the years to come, you know, um, if for conducting monitoring, um, you can see hot off the press when it becomes available. And this is certainly something that exactly post-surgery would be indicated. However, um, other liquid biopsies um, such as the one I mentioned where there is the DNA repair genes, uh, maybe for a PARP inhibitor. This is really for later stage um, cancer. So if yours is localized enough that you yeah. are on yeah, the, and the, the hormone therapy and surgery, um, that you wouldn't need to go that far. I'm not going to have a surgery. I'm just going to have a hormone therapy and the radiation. Yeah. Exactly. And so this is where in prostate cancer, really, we have very different steps for the different stages. Mm -hmm. So, for, yeah. So, so for you, to... for your, for this situation, the mm -hmm. liquid biopsy would not be indicated the ones for the PARP inhibitor just yet. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. but done on the future, like a year from now or something, we're going to maybe have the, something. Which is... Yeah. The PARP inhibitor one is for when one has sort of full blown later stage um, cancer that is highly shedding, but the, the presence of CTDNA, this is, I don't know when it would be available for prostate cancer, but maybe in two, three years, potentially. Mm -hmm. And this is always something that um, one could uh, apply when monitoring. It's an extra monitoring tool alongside PSA and other screening tools that you would have. Thank you very much, doctor. I appreciate it. Thank you You're for welcome. your answer. Thank you. Thank you. Terrell has a two part, very important question. And what? Oh, he yeah. Go, yeah. Hi, Dr. Puentes. I want to thank you for coming on that. It's very informative, although a lot of what you've talked about is way over my pay grade. <laughs> <I'm sorry>. uh, <laughs> but that's okay. Uh, but I, I just have two quick questions. Do most cancer treatment centers provide liquid biopsies? And is it covered by Medicare? It is covered by Medicare, I believe. Rachel, you can also chime in here. Um, do most cancer centers cover it? They offer it, they should. Unfortunately, most cancer centers should also offer all the testing of these genes. Uh, unfortunately, the reality is we see discrepancies amongst different facilities. We just see discrepancies amongst the same, in the same centers amongst different practitioners. Is it habit? Is it awareness? Is it cost? These are all inhibiting factors. Um, slight discrepancy in care that occurs, right? But the availability is there. So this is why patient advocacy for yourself, the knowledge of it um, is key in, in, in making this available to you because it, it is there for you, yes. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna skip, uh, Rachel, Ira, I'm gonna come back to you. I'm gonna go to Bob Morris here. How to use biomarkers in reincurrence years after surgery before secondary treatment? Earlier genetic testing showed no mutations. Question, can a liquid biopsy give indication of aggressiveness and volume of tumor load? That's Bob, Bob's question here. Um, cannot. Um, uh, the CTDNA potentially, but this is so, still sort of on the science research that's being researched. What's clinically available um, cannot um, inform sort of aggressiveness. Um, no. Okay, let's go, let's, let's go back to uh, Ira and Rachel. Uh, Ira wanted to know uh, what, um, how sensitive the test is, and, and is, I don't know if you have chat open, folks, but uh, Rachel replied, analytic ver validation demonstrated accuracy of 98% sensitivity of a 95.1 and specificity of 98.8. Yeah, now this is for our very sensitive 
um, oh no, no, this is for the liquid biopsy, not the very sensitive assay if one has reoccurrence, but sort of um, looking for genes, gene mutations, looking for biomarkers, the li that liquid biopsy. And so these statistics are the liquid, i.e. Oh, the blood results compared to the tissue results. So there's a 98% concordance in results. So high confidential confidence in results. Um, using the blood and the tissue to the point where guidelines have changed in lung, for example. Um, it used to be the, the gold standard was we test tissue first. If unavailable, then um, with hesitance, we can use liquid biopsy. You know, sometimes it's hard to get a biopsy for various reasons from a patient. In this case, they said, yes, we could then use um, blood those guidelines have now changed to say they are on par with each other. And we could even test a blood first if we want to get um, faster results. And, and that's based on these statistics that the, the, the blood and the, the tumor tissue really do correlate at, at advanced stage, at advanced stage, this is to say, advanced stage disease. Okay. Um we look like we may be heading towards an age when a neogenomics blood draw might screen a variety of cancers and be as routine as our cholesterol labs and our our, our blood sugar labs. I mean, are we headed there where we're going to be able to catch cancers really early? And uh, patient anxiety about such a lab draw notwithstanding, uh, is this going to be part of our, our annual physical? I think, um, now this is personal opinion, I think we are headed there. Our, our, um, the neogenomics, uh, looking for biomarkers is more for later stage. That's when we know if there's tumor presence, uh, but the presence of cancer DNA, even in the early stages, um, the science is, is catching up with being able to detect that. Um, and I think in the next, 10 to 20 years, we'd be heading there to um, have that uh, be part of regular visits. I see it, for example, let's take, um, yeah, prostate is a good um, example. When you have prostate hyperplasia before you may have a tumor, right? In that window, we could maybe be monitoring. Um, for increase or a presence of that cancer DNA, um, colorectal cancer between polyposis, um, you know, sort of at risk patients. I definitely see the field moving towards that direction. And uh, that's just personal opinion, research informed, I would say. Outstanding. Uh, I'll go back to Ira. Are your tests covered for all stages of prostate cancer? What is out of pocket cost for non Medicare? And do how many different genes do you test? Um, okay, so we have um, a prostate panel um, which uses molecular testing for all stages of prostate, um, which uses the tissue, tissue biopsy. Um, liquid biopsies only approved for later advanced stage cancers and so that's also insurance right covering um that um out-of-pocket costs i don't know rachel you might be able to um chime in here um you know various insurances um yeah and we also have um you know patient programs within neogenomic for financial assistance and um, that does exist yeah, so from a neo patient program standpoint, if you guys have insurance, Medicare, or other coverage, commercial coverage, um, we would run that in specific to your benefits in your program. And then if there is a prohibitive cost to you, we have patient support financial assistance. Um, we also have sponsor testing programs sometimes um, that is available to you as well. So it's kind of hard to designate, as Rasheen said, to that specific question, but we do have comprehensive programs for patients to make sure that cost is not a prohibitor for you getting the comprehensive testing that she presented today. Okay, uh, back to Bob. Is there any use of liquid biopsies that are now for prostate cancer during non-advanced recurrence? Mm, no. Okay, 
not from your company, not from anybody else's. No, as far as I'm aware of, no. Um, where I would like to see it is um, for PARP inhibitor indication, but those genes are not usually covered in a liquid biopsy, and um, that would be a tissue biopsy. Excellent. Um, I think I'm going to just take this break here and ask you to please support the Prostate Forum of Orange County. Uh, no doubt, if if you're here, you've got our um, you got our uh, our um, our appeal for for donations, and we'll make certainly make one here. Uh, help contribute to our life saving work. Put, mail your check or money order, no cash, please, to Prostate Forum of Orange County, fifteen nineteen East Chapman Avenue, Box three eighty, in Fullerton nine two eight three one. And you can also go online if you if you want to use a credit card at www.prostateforum.org support us we will send you back a thank you as quickly as we can so you can put that in your file for tax deductibility we still need to pay zoom youtube rent well rent is out of here insurance mm -hmm. mailing wix website hosting state and federal regulatory requirements printing costs etc printing costs are going to be coming up folks because we're meeting in person we're going to be at at cruising for a cure this saturday from about 9 a.m. to 1 p.m. And that means we got to print brochures to give out. We're back to that again uh, after three years of, of dealing with a pandemic and other issues. We are 100% volunteer. You don't pay any salaries. Virtually every dollar goes back into communications one way or another. Uh, learn tech skills and help us out with our work. Your time and expertise is greatly needed for a few hours every week. Brian McAvoy is here. Our chief technical officer needs your help with putting get, putting our videos and other important information on our website. Yes, you can work from home anywhere. Our newest volunteer is working from Oregon. Uh, you can work from home, as I said. We will train you. Contact us right here at prostateformoc at gmail.com, and we will tell you more, and we'll hook you up with Brian, who can uh, help you with training and, and other questions. Uh, you can leave a lasting legacy. The Prostate Forum of Orange County greatly accepts donations from required minimum distribution accounts, 401ks, 403bs, etc. Uh, you can also leave us in your will or your trust. And if you want more information, check it out here. It'll tell you how to do that. As always, work with your financial advisor. And by all means, have your financial advisor contact us at prostateformoc at gmail.com. We'll be glad to have our treasurer, Jim Bothwell, work with your financial advisor. I'm going to get back to questions. Let's see. Uh, how many different genes do you test? Are there any new questions that we can share with the, the neogenomics team? Well, with that, I want to thank you. Uh, we had quite a turnout of the Neogenomics team tonight. Thank you for sending us so many knowledgeable people. And be watching your email for exciting announcements about other presentations, support groups, and we will be hosting support groups through November and December. Watch your email for more information about support groups. In the meantime, I want to thank everybody and, and say good night if there are no other questions. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Thank you very much. We look forward Thank to seeing you. you next month at the next presentation.